Thank you for joining us. Hello, I'm Jay Hirsch, Director of Administration of Columbia's ERM program. I'd like to inform you about some upcoming ERM events that may be of interest to you. On November 18th, we have our panel on privacy and cross-border jurisdictions. And on December 3rd, we have a panel on conduct risk, the consequences of bad behavior. And now to present opening remarks, here is Sim Siegel, Academic Director and Senior Lecturer in Discipline of the ERM program. Sim. Thank you, Jay. And welcome everyone. And thank you for joining us today. I'm Sim Siegel, Founder and Director of the ERM program here at Columbia University. And we're proud to bring you today's event, which is the first in a new series. Our CRO Spotlight Series features interviews with leading chief risk officers. Columbia attracts some of the best and brightest minds from all over the world in faculty, but also in guest speakers. And our featured CRO speaker today, Lloyd Puente, is another example. Uh, Dr. Bob Kostakopoulos, Deputy Academic Director and Lecturer, will serve as moderator for today's event. Bob? Thank you, Sim, for the nice introduction. Uh, greetings, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening. Uh, as you know, panels are an important uh, co-curricular activity in the ERM program. Uh, the Chief Risk Officer CRO Spotlight Series was originated with Academic Director and Founder Sim Sigal. The CRO function is enshrined in the bank regulatory framework as a key executive suite level function. You cannot be a bank and not have a well-defined CRO function in your executive suite. Uh, we are privileged to inaugurate the CRO Spotlight Series with Mr. Lloyd Plenty. Uh, Lloyd is the CRO, Corporate and Investment Bank and Asset Management, America's BNP Paribas, the French Global Bank. Mr. Plenty joined BNP uh, Paribas in 1996 and is currently the CRO for CIBAM Americas, where he's responsible for credit, counterparty, market, an operational risk infrastructure framework monitoring and reporting. Uh, previously, Mr. Plenty had been the global head of investor managers and market infrastructures, where his team covered risks involving asset managers, wealth management, prime brokerage, clearing, central counterparties, and electronic markets. Lloyd was also responsible for developing collateral, uh, collateral policies for CIB and IS business polls. Prior to that, uh, Lloyd was the regional co-head of risk capital markets for the Americas and the head of counterparty risk financial institutions for the Americas. Before joining BNP Paribas, Lloyd spent four years at SBC Warburg, where he performed a number of roles including transaction analysis on capital markets transactions, credit systems, and credit policy developments. Welcome, Lloyd. It's a privilege for me to be with you on this panel. Thank you. I'd like, uh, thank you. I'd like to start with a, uh, with a question. You have a sterling career in banking. Could you kindly share with our students the highlights of your career, please? Well, thank you, Bob. It's uh, just firstly say it's a pleasure for me to be, you know, the inaugural speaker on your CRO Spotlight series. I feel as if you've brought in one of your own, actually, because I'm a, a Columbia parent. My daughter is in the uh, engineering school, a junior there, and she's also a member of the uh, your NCAA champion fencing team. So I told her I'd give a shout out to the fencing team and to say, you know, hello to all of her Columbia brothers and sisters. So it's a pleasure for me. And now to address your question, Eventful career, I'd say sterling career, uh, yes. So I, you know, if you look at the highlights for me, I mean, certainly um, being appointed CRO four and a half years ago uh, was very important. And I think that's been sort of the pinnacle so far in terms of professional development. And um, also had the honor of being the first non-French person um, to be in that position, which um, was actually sort of highly unusual. Um, and when I kind of look back to the steps of my career, I mean, I can come to the US as I did in 2003 was quite pivotal. You know, I came into a new market, new environment. Um, 
So that was, that was very, very interesting. When I step back and I think about, okay, as a, as a risk manager, what, you know, what are the challenges you've had? You know, what are the periods that have defined your development? You know, I think back to the late 1990s when we had the emerging markets crisis, the Russian debt crisis, you know, early 2000s with a dot-com bubble. And those seemed like crises. I mean, in retrospect now, <laughs> they were probably not significant crises. Um, you know, certainly I think when I think of what really developed me and was significant, I'd go to 2008 and the Great Recession crisis, which was obviously a tremendously difficult period for everyone in the financial industry. Um, for myself at the time, I was heading up the capital markets risk and counterparty risk analysis. So we had a tremendously difficult time. You know, we had a number of peer counterparties, clients, um, you think of at the time the mortgage originators, the, the banks themselves. Um, you had a lot of um, you know you had you had a you know you had a lot of different sectors. You know the monoline insurers, which had really been supporting a lot of the activity <laughs> that took place in the end in terms of some of the transactions that went bad. You know we had to navigate through all of those. We had creditor committees. I was on. We were having int intraday and um, crisis management meetings. Uh, you know, I was working probably from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. every evening for probably close to two and a half months. So physically draining. But I learned a lot in that period. I mean, I'd say that for me, it was I was lucky enough to be at the Fed at the, the weekend of the prior to the Lehman bankruptcy. And that was that was important. So, you know, there were a number of different working groups that were set up. I'd actually been assigned to the risk working group that was meant to work with how, you know, how we would manage risk in the post Lehman default period. Actually, before that working group started, my boss, who was a CRO at the time, called me and he said, oh, there's a seat in the, um, in the CEO's meeting. So I went into that meeting um, and I think they were, trying, they were trying to work out who's this guy coming into our meeting. But I sat down and, you know, I heard the Treasury Secretary, Hank Paulson at the time, talk about, you know, how the, how the US public would not allow them to rescue another investment bank. It was up to the private sector to manage that. Um, you know, after beer stones, we're not doing any more. Obviously, that wasn't the case in the end. A few weeks later, in fact, a few days later, you had intervention with AIG. Um, you had, obviously, TARP, and you saw all the support measures that took place afterwards that took us through, you know, two years of a, a very tough recession. So, for me, that was, that was pivotal. I learned a lot about the need for government intervention which may not have been obvious to people at the time, certainly from a regulatory perspective, you hadn't really seen that prior to that. Um, and then just looking at the interactions between banks and the government, it was quite interesting to see how, you know, different relationships were developed with the authorities that had some interesting outcomes in terms of what transpired after that. So for me, I'd say that was probably very, very, that, if that's a highlight, um, probably it's the uh, time that I think of as really having defined me as a risk manager. Well, certainly that, uh, that was a trying time and, uh, and uh, we all gained a lot of experiences uh, and by, me, by, uh, by all I mean uh, industry, regulators, the whole ecosystem. Yes. Uh, we learned that uh, in, in uh, a crisis of that type, you need not only the Fed uh, to be the lender of, of last resort, but you also need the treasury to um, uh, basically be the uh, uh, equity provider uh, of last yeah. resort because the markets uh, uh, will not uh, participate. Um, so thank you. Uh, that was uh, quite a um, uh, quite a, uh, a history. Um, the um, about COVID nineteen. This morning's uh, Wall Street Journal headline: uh, Stock futures slip on COVID-19 concerns. How does a global bank like yours navigate the relevant risks in an ERM context? So obviously, you know, when we talked about crisis, this is one that we're living through at the moment. We talked about 2008, clearly, and COVID is very different to us. It's impact us, impacting us in a way that we didn't see in 2008. So 2008 was really a financial markets crisis, stability of the financial system. Um, here with COVID, that's not really what's a threat. In fact, the banking system has been providing a large degree of support to the corporate markets and as well to the, uh, 
to the you know, to the retail markets through the government in many cases, but still providing that support. I, I think for us, how we navigate ourselves is actually quite complex because we are impacted across the globe and across all of our business lines. So if you think at the side of what do we have? We've got a pandemic where a large proportion of our, of our staff are working from home. I mean, we're currently at around 90% of our staff working from home. So just getting our infrastructure in place to even be in a position to manage the risks and the challenges was quite difficult. We, you know, we, we, we didn't have that in our BCP planning that we would have, you know, we'd have so many people working from home. In fact, to a large degree, we were helped by, uh, if you recall the, um, the helicopter crash last year in, in, uh, in, in central Manhattan, that was actually on top of our building. Um, and what, what we learned was that, you know, it happened very quickly. Yeah, it was very bizarre for me because actually I'd left the building 20 minutes before my way to Paris for some management meeting. So I actually was out of the building when it happened. But people couldn't get back in. You had, you know, you know, people had to work remotely for a few days. A lot of people actually didn't have laptops and they had desktops, they couldn't get back into the building. So somehow what we learned from that was, okay, we need to make sure that we have, um, you know, that we have the right, you know, the right um, facilities and the right technology to make sure staff can work remotely. So come the start of the pandemic, largely we had most of our staff with laptops and able to work remotely. But what we didn't have initially was the bandwidth on our network to support having 5,000 users all on at the same time. So that took a couple of weeks to, to manage. So we start with the context of us being in a situation where we're trying to work out and organize our own infrastructure at the same time that we're trying to look at risks in the, you know, market volatility, huge market volatility, as you saw, you know, the market indices, VIX up in the high 80s, you know, big stock market drop, a lot of volatility, credit markets depressed, loan indexes down significantly, high volatility, you had clients in the financial markets that were struggling, typically mortgage REITs and funds, particularly hedge funds that had large um, tail risk and you know, volatility funds with large tail risk had, you know, had their challenges. Um, so you could see, so we were sort of managing challenges that clients had. Biggest part was going to be on the corporate side. And we knew that the defaults and the challenges would come there. Not initially, but certainly some of the weaker clients going into COVID were heavily impacted. So you're managing, you're managing potential client crises or managing clients with needs for additional liquidity, coming down, drawing on credit facilities. And so you're managing the liquidity profile of the bank you're managing market risk and trying to look at that. And then on, on the, on the non-financial side, heightened cyber risks. I mean, we didn't luckily, I, think, I, don't, I don't think the market saw a lot actually come out of COVID in terms of the impacts of the, um, you, know, you know, actual cyber threats and materialized, but clearly that was an important thing to look at. You had, um, you know, operate, you had um, operational risks that were increasing, people work from home, and, you know, a lot of processes that were, be, that were taking place, that were normally taking place in the office, and um, trading activities, payments, they all had, they, they were done, being done remotely, you know, you needed regulatory authorization for that. Um, so you're managing the operational risks, in some cases having to, um, you have risk acceptances, knowing that some of your controls won't be as strong as if, if they're in the office but you identify what those risks are, you make sure you document them, you make sure you have the right decision-making forums to, to manage that. So across all of that, we had a destabilized firm that we had to make, that we had to stabilize and then try to manage the risks for, for the bank as well as for our clients. And so how did we, so to answer your question, finally, I'd say that how we managed that was through you know, a very good organization structure a lot of the a lot of the decision making forums we had in place had been enhanced over several years, so we didn't have to create new forums. We didn't have to create crisis management. We just increased the frequency of these forums on the different risks and use them as a decision making forums. Also, we were very we were actually because it was a global pandemic. It was actually fairly decentralized in terms of how we managed it. So we didn't have to say, hey, we want to do X, Y, and Z, and then go to Paris for approval. All regions were managing the crisis in their own regions. 
and uh, and there wasn't a huge amount of central coordination, but we didn't really necessarily need that because I think you know we had given enough strength to the the actual regions themselves to be able to make their decisions and and move ahead. I think out of it we came out of it relatively well, but it was really having a strong con control and command structure. Thank you. That's um, uh, you know that's very true. I hear that a lot from uh, other global banks uh, where. Uh, they say the uh, 2008, uh, uh, you know, financial crisis uh, and the ensuing uh, regulatory changes uh, helped them, uh, you know, stress testing and so forth, helped them um, uh, be ready for a new crisis for which they had not prepared uh, as such. So um, that's, uh, that's, that's good news. Um, now we are uh, seeing in the north, northern hemisphere the uh, the virus um, uh, on an exponential uh, J curve. Uh, is the industry prepared for the consequences of what appears to be a tough winter in terms of credit risk, uh, government, uh, government response to mitigating the economic fallout, and central bank response? Yeah, you know when you look at those different things, I would say is the industry ready? I think depending on where you are in the industry, your impacts will be, you know, could be more or less. So I think for, if you look at the banking sector, um, you know, a lot will depend on what happens to the government support. Because let's be frank, I mean, a lot of the fact that we haven't seen a huge number of defaults, so we've seen somewhat are typically investment grade industries still being propped up. They've been propped up largely by, you know, so support coming through the CARES Act or through the fact that they were able to go to the markets and get liquidity. In Q2, you saw a lot of the large corporates going to the bond markets and the loan markets to buffer up liquidity. So I think when I think, so I think it becomes almost a tale of several cities. I think for large IG corporates in non-COVID, I would say sensitive sectors, I think they'll be fine and they've taken the additional liquidity. I think the challenge for them going forward will be in a couple of years time as the increased borrowings start to, you know, start to increase their, their costs, their overall cost funding costs. What does it do to their leverage overall? What does it do to their profitability? But they'll be fine. Um, I think for the, the COVID sectors that are, that are more impacted, yeah, I, mean, I think they still need those industries, you know, and you think they're about hotel, you know, aviation, um, tourism, hotels, leisure, gaming, retail, and autos to a degree as well, I think they will still require you know, some need of you know, support in some form, probably through at least the next 12 months. I don't think we see that there'll be an, an immediate bounce back for them in the same way. Um, and then for banks and others that are really dependent on consumer finance, um, you know, so far because of um, PPP, deferrals, other things have been put in place to enable consumers to manage the, uh, you know, to manage this crisis. Because, you know, will, will the government in Congress uh, be able to sort of uh, reach an agreement in relatively quick time to stop, uh, stop, stop us from having, you know, unemployment spiking up again? Uh, and really, you know, if that does happen, that could be very, very consequ consequential. So is the bank, are banks we ready? I think we're as ready as, as we can be, but a lot depends on what happens from, from, the, from the federal and central governments. I think the Fed, there's not a huge amount more I can see the Fed doing. I mean, if you look at some of the funding programs they put in place over COVID, and some of them were the rebuilding of previous 2008 policies and plans that they had. Um, the take up on those was not that huge. So, I'm not sure there's a lot more for the Treasury to do. I think a lot more will come down to uh, a more con you know, congressional agreement over what sort of funding and support to provide, particularly to, to consumers. Right. Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, thank you. Uh, the, uh, the Fed uh, uh, has, uh, is making a plea, actually, uh, judging by the uh, October 6th, I think, uh, conference that uh, Chairman Powell gave where he actually pleaded with Congress to do something um, by way of um, yeah. some fiscal stimulus uh, number two. Um, and and uh, now I think it's becoming even more uh, 
uh, clear that that's needed and it, it, uh, it may be needed sooner than later. Um, now, um, moving on to another question, uh, what do you see as the main focus, points of focus that regulators uh, have today with regards to risk practices at banks? How has that focus shifted over the recent years? So, you know, it's kind of interesting. When I first came to the US in 2003, um, I think I met my first regulator, and I, I, and I won't say which agency, agency it was, maybe a few months after joining. Uh, so I had a, a, you know, this person from the agency, you know, said, look, I need to speak to you about credit counterparty risk. I'm finishing my review of your operations. Can we have a talk? It'll only take half an hour. So he booked a meeting half an hour on a Friday afternoon came into my office and said, look, I don't know anything about credit and counterparty risk, but I've got to write something up for my boss. Please, can you, uh, you know, please, can you um, just tell me what it is? And after half an hour of me explaining what it was, he said, yep, I think I've got enough. Thank you very much. That was my first encounter with the US regulator. Um, and that wasn't, necess that wasn't typical. I mean, I thought it was, it's, anecdotally, it's funny or concerning. Um, I'm not going to say that that was common, but it was my first impression of regulation. And certainly when you looked up to 2008, what you saw was, you know, I think very light regulation. I mean, I think it was sort of, it was sort of more government policy not to regulate the financial sector too heavily. And so we saw very little pushback. And so then coming into 2008, obviously the, the reaction was going to be very, very strong. I'd say post 2008, what you saw was clearly financial stability. So everything was about the focus was on financial stability. It was about the you know banks having sufficient capital, um, to to you know it was the development of of stress testing to ensure that banks had sufficient capital to withstand stress events. Moved on a bit after that to you know li you know liquidity topics as well. What about liquidity? We certainly saw for ourselves. You know we had the euro debt crisis of 2011, 2012, which for us as a European bank was our own trauma that we had to manage our way through. So, you know, focus on liquidity was strong. Um, I'd say in, in recent years, you saw things like, you know, operational, operational risk became a focus. In fact, actually going back before operational risk, we obviously had the, um, obviously with the derivatives markets with central clearing and bilateral initial, initial margin, the move to shift the uh, the costs of default from the um, creditor pays to the defaulter pays model, so that was one of the things that obviously that was key between you know as part of that post two thousand and eight um, development. I shouldn't have forgotten that. Um, but going on to more recent years, so the focus has been now much more third party risk management, um, operational risk, info, info information security, cyber threats, and. Um, I think going forward, as we look into 2021, and you're seeing this now with you know, from pronouncements and, guide, and guidance that you're seeing for some of the regulators, it's about climate change. ECB and the European banks have been ahead, I think fairly, I think versus the US in terms of really, uh, well, such as European regulators have been much more involved in looking at you know, how we seeking to manage climate change, what are the financial risks of that? How do we model that? How do we bring that into our projections? So the ECB started first. You then saw the CFTC a few months ago developing thought processes along similar lines. Recently, the uh, you know, we're starting to see now more from the banking regulators as well in that. So I think that for this year and the coming years, the next five, six years, I think will be a big focus. Um, I'd also say operational resilience, the ability to withstand the pandemics, the floods, the uh, cyber threats. I mean, operational resilience is quite a complex topic, but it's clearly a major topic for the regulators today. And then I'd say the third topic, which probably has a shorter lifespan is LIBOR transition. So the move from LIBOR to, the, uh, to another risk-free rate, in the US, it's going to be SOFA, which is a secured overnight funding rate, which has its own challenges, by the way. Um, you know, that's where we see a lot of regulatory focus. So I think as we, as we, look, toward, as we look at the current time, I would say definitely climate has become one of the, is, is emerging as one of their top focuses. 
um, operational resilience, which will be there, I think, for a number of years. And I think there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of investigation on that. And we expect to see more and more come out in terms of guidance. And live, we're just making sure that, you know, banks and clients are ready for that, for that transition. Yes, well, thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, I know the uh, regulators had a um, guidance out for, uh, uh, you know, feedback from the industry as to, uh, for example, uh, when it comes to operational resiliency, what uh, type of metric uh, would they, do they use, should they use? Uh, so the regulators uh, are getting feedback from the industry as to uh, how to develop the uh, metrics uh, for operational uh, operational uh, resilience, um, and of course, when uh, the climate is very important, I was talking to some bankers the other day, and they said, you know, uh, you have the pandemic on the one hand, and then you've got uh, the wildfires in California, yeah. then you've got the um, uh, hurricanes, uh, the, the flooding in, in in the southeast, and uh, those events are climate related. Uh, so. Yes. It's it's uh, to your point uh, about climate being uh, the focus of regulators. Um, uh, it's it's um, it's a risk that's being recognized by industry and and uh, regulators, and it has to be addressed in in, uh, in an effective way. Uh, thank you for for your answer. Uh, I have another question here. We have another question uh, uh, in terms of the uh, uh, risk identification programs and risk appetite statements. Uh, that have emerged as key foundational elements in an ERM program. How have you developed them and what should they cover? Yeah. So that's interesting. You know, for us, you know, risk identification, risk appetite statements. I remember many years you know, at, at the bank, and this is probably true of a lot of European banks, no one really wanted to define what their risk appetite statement was or their risk appetite was. Um, you know, I think management wanted to keep some degree of flexibility um, and, you know, go with the flow a bit and, and just see how things develop. They kind of knew what, what it was in terms of maybe headline risk, but no one really wanted to put that down in a very formal way in terms of paper. So that, that stopped. I mean, you know, four or five years ago, it was like, no, no, no. We, you know, regulators expected it. And they expected it for the, for the government's bodies of those banks to also understand, you know, what is, the, what is the risk appetite of this bank that you are supervising, even as an external director? So when you look at the two programs, they're, they're not separate. They're all part of what we would call a risk anticipation program. So risk identification is really identifying across all of the risk stripes, um, you know, what are the, what are the material and, and non-material risks? So how we've built up the risk ID programs that we start with risk explorers, as we call them, coming from the business lines as well as from risk, to go through every single risk stripe and identify what are, what are the material, what are the risks. And you, we, you list all of the risks, and then we created a matrix of materiality versus um, frequency. Um, and then you, you allocate, so and the materiality is based on sizing the potential losses from those risks. And the frequency is a one in three year event, is a one in 10 year or one in a hundred year event. And wherever, and where, and then obviously part of your grid puts you into material versus non material. So when we then start looking at the, um, you know, those material risks, we then start looking, well, what are the mitigants around them? What are the controls that we have in place? And they really form the basis, I would say, for the risk ID really forms the basis for your risk appetite statement. And it also forms the basis for your CCAR um, scenario analysis as well. So you want to make sure you've identified all of your material risks and then you, you start to uh, use them as foundational elements for your risk appetite statement um, and CCAR. So for our risk appetite, it goes all across the main risk stripes. Um, again, you know, we have early warning levels. We have and limits. Some may just have early warnings because they're not maybe things that you can manage to a limit, but you want at least so when you hit the trigger to have discussions about this risk that could be emerging and how do we deal with that. Um, it also gives the board a, a frame of reference and a context to understand the risks on the on the platform. So when we have our meetings with the and we have quarterly 
board meetings where we have external directors on our US board, you know, we go through the risk appetite changes, you know, we, uh, we, you know, we give them a full overview and they're able to use the risk appetite statement way of gauging where we are as opposed to us talking with that outside of a framework that may be difficult or challenging them to really understand how material is this. So I think these are very important, all banks have them. Um, and I think all, in, you know, all, even if you're not a bank, I think it's still important to, to identify that in any type of, in any type of uh, commercial entity. That's great, thank you. Um, the, um, in, in terms of the pandemic, right, and the, uh, your experience um, uh, during this uh, time, uh, what would you say is the biggest lesson you learned in the, in the last uh, 10 months or so? You know, I'd say um, never be surprised. You know, if you had told me 10 months ago, you would, we would have 90% of our staff working remotely, I would have said, no, that's just not going to happen. It wouldn't be feasible. We just wouldn't be able to connect like that. So what I've learned is that, yeah, don't be surprised. In fact, going into um, 2020, you know, when we were in our, risk anticipation and our, you know, we always, in our part of our risk ID, risk anticipation reviews, we go through what are the emerging risks um, for 2020. We didn't have a global pandemic in our top 20. <laughs> okay. When you look at even, you know, forms like the World Economic Forum and others who come up with their, their you know, their global surveys of the emerging risks, I think World Economic Forum had global, had a pandemic as you know, number 10 in terms of potential severity, if there was a pandemic. So I think it's kind of taught me that we, uh, you know, don't be surprised by anything. Uh, you know, the challenges that come are typically often the ones that you're not expecting. Uh, and that, you know, but you have to learn from each one. I mean, now, you know, when we look at what I've learned is that we can operate with a large percentage of our population work from home. But at the same time, I also recognize that that comes with costs. And uh, so it's not you know, ideally what we want, um, but that we, can, that we can still function credibly with that. So I think if I'm saying what I've learned is don't be surprised about <laughs> anything. And, and typically the risks that you're not expecting are the ones that often, that often come up. It's very true, uh, but it, it, uh, it pays to be prepared and, uh, yes. and uh, for any kind of risk, because that's going to allow you to do well, uh, no matter what risk uh, materializes. Um, so how do you keep your staff motivated through this pandemic? Um, well, there's keeping myself motivated and keeping my team motivated. Um, you know, I'd say for the team, you know, when you're in the start of a crisis, and this was true of 2008 as well, you're running on adrenaline, okay? So you see these teams, they are running on adrenaline. So we had people working from home, you'd be on conference calls or WebEx videos. And, you know, you'd hear the, the dog barking, you know, the children looking for attention. Uh, but people kind of kept going. And, but, you know, and, and you'd see, you know, I was getting emails from some of my team members, uh, you know, I'd get emails at one o'clock in the morning. When I woke up in the morning, I said, what are you doing? Um, you know, I know there's a lot to do, but at the same time, you still have to preserve your health and your longevity because, you know, I learned from 2008, it was a bit like that and that was a, a bit like a marathon. Uh, and, it, and it sometimes felt like a bit of a boxing match. And, you know, they say that even great boxers, they have that one fight that takes everything out of them and they're never the same after that. I said, you don't want these crises <laughs> to put you in that way. So you've got to maintain some sort of balance. So how we kept staff motivated was, was to really, as you know, Communication was everything. So people had started losing, you know, it was a potential to lose that, that sort of human contact, that contact collaboration with your teammates. So there are more and more frequent team meetings, um, more and more forums. You know, we would, we would hold WebExes on even different topics. We held WebExes on um, COVID-19 and social justice, even things that were a little bit different from the, the financial part of our activities, just getting people to think about other things. We would have newsletters that would go out saying what people were doing and, uh, you know, features on people's top, you know, you know topical things that they're interested in, you know, bringing the personal side together. 
again, a lot of town halls, a lot of communication. I would, for myself, I mean, I was able to communicate with my team heads and, and the management team. So that was very, very frequent. But I realized, you know, the connection that I'd have with the more junior staff that you'd see in the co at the coffee machine or who'd come into your office for a 10 minute chat or whatever. I was losing that. I mean, that it was everything was being done hierarchically. And those other connections that breached the hierarchy divide and weren't really happening. So I started actually Skyping team members just at random, junior team members. <laughs> and I think it was quite funny because they would um, think, why is Lloyd calling me? Am I in trouble? <laughs> and it was like, no, no, you're not in trouble. I just want to see how you are, how you're getting on. I think people are a bit surprised by that, but I think we had to do that. Um, so we've kept staff motivated to a large degree, but I also sense now, and I can feel now, people start to get tired. And, you know, we've had a lot of requests from regulators and others to produce information. A lot of teams have worked long hours and it hasn't really stopped. So we've reduced some frequency of things. We've been able to slim some things down. But I'm very cognizant that, you know, this is not something that we can continue for a very long time and um, not in the same way. And um, so, you know, a second you know, another wave coming with more dire consequences, I think would be very, very challenging for us. Um, so we've done well up to this point, but I'm not taking for granted that that continues. Thank you. Um, the, um, in, in the same uh, 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 line, uh, is your role now uh, more in demand by the uh, executive suite? Um, you know, I think it was always, in demand, I think 2000, since 2008, it's definitely um, always been in demand. I mean, now expectations of what they expect you to be able to speak on has obviously gone much broader. Um, you know, 12 years ago, I was only really talking about counterparty credit and market risk. I mean, that was it. I mean, that was my focus. And um, I could speak well to those. Um, we hadn't focused so much on liquidity risks, operational risks, cyber, model risks, compliance risks. Um, now you're expected to be able to address those topics at, a, at very senior levels, which means, yes, the skill set's in demand. Um, it's challenging. You can't be an expert in everything, but you have to understand the fundamentals of everything. And you, be, you need to understand the connections and connectivity <laughs> between the different uh, risk stripes and, and, and to anticipate what the impacts could be. Um, and also being in the risk function, you actually get to see much more of the organization than many other functions. Um, so from my position, you know, I work very closely, not just with, you know, we work with the board, but we also work with our CIB executive management. So I sit on the executive committee of CIB um, I sit on their business leadership forum as well, which is the head of CIB and his direct reports. And me as the only non-direct report of his coming from a function. And that's because they truly understand that it's important to get risk on board and for us to understand the strategy because we have to be okay with it. I mean, we are a second line of defense um, and maybe that, and I think, you know, the, the regulators expect us to be a second line of defense our board expects us to be a second line of defense and to a degree a business advisor. And, and the business lines expect us to, to, to be an advisor. Actually, before, I was a bit concerned about this interview because at 7.20, I got a call from uh, some members of my team on a very large transaction that they wanted to, uh, that we need approval on tomorrow. And, uh, and they were saying that we need you in a meeting. So I've told them the meeting will take place after nine o'clock. <laughs> it's not that urgent. Well, it is urgent, but I said, you know, this come obviously I'm, I'm committed, I'm doing this. But, you know, but they wanted to get, they, they needed my feedback, you know, will this get through? I mean, what are the problems that you see with it? And in five minutes, I just had a very quick overview. We'll have the committee probably tomorrow and we'll do some analysis again, you know, this morning and, um, and this afternoon. So the demand's there. And I said, as a CRO, from my position, people kind of expect you to know a reasonable about, about a, a lot of things, um, which makes it fairly unique. And as having, as I said, access to being in the board meetings, as well as on the business development meetings, strategy meetings, you get, uh, you're, you're probably well placed to get a, a you know, very good view of the overall organization.
So that's uh, that sounds like a, a, a good structure that we have the uh, ERM uh, function integrated into strategy and uh, yes. business strategy. Well, you know, every year, planning. as we yeah, every year, as I say, as we do our risk appetite statement, we have to we have to present to the board our analysis of whether the business strategy uh, and the budget are aligned with risk appetite. That's uh, so, yeah, that's great. Yeah, that re so it really is foundational. And if and if we say no on anything, then some business developments at times may not happen. If we feel that it's it, it takes us outside of where we think we should be. That's uh, you know that's that, that's wonderful. You are uh, we, you know uh, I think the regulators would love you for it, right? Uh, because you are performing your function independently of uh, the um, vested interests. Um, so the, in terms of um, uh, being a global bank, uh, how does uh, a global bank communicate with its various uh, stakeholders, especially now through this pandemic? Yeah. So, you know, we've had stakeholders at clearly at different levels. So, you know, we think of the boards, um, you think of the regulators, I'd say I'd call them the prime stakeholders. I mean, within the business lines, our you know our day-to-day -day activities are fine. And um, with the board, it was very much through regular communication. And um, we had interim board meetings, so not just the quarterly ones, we held them on a more frequent cadence. And um, we produced risk dashboards, and we would speak to the, uh, to the uh, external directors personally to tell them what was going on, how we were managing as a risk function, and as well, um, you know, looking at where, where, where are the main risks on the platform. So a lot of work on that in, in dashboards that they could digest pretty easily with a narrative to give them a sense of what the challenges were. Um, and, you know, similarly, we had a lot of, a lot of interaction with the, uh, the regulators. So, you know, we're a heavily regulated bank, even in the US. So we have, you know, we have our home office regulators, the ECB and the French ACPR. We come to the US, we're now working, you know, we work with the Fed, the New York DFS um, on the banking side. And then you have CFTC, SEC, NFA, FINRA. We were communicating to all of them. I mean, we were getting multiple requests for information and requests for meetings. And it was, and it was constant. And, you know, they're not working together. Some, there was overlap in some of the topics, not always. Um, depending on what their focus, the focus point of that agency was, so we found there was a lot of communication. We're fairly well organized. So we have a supervisory relations group that actually coordinate with the regulators and they bring everything into one place so that, you know, they manage the interactions, the documentation, and to make sure that, you know, we're consistent in our messaging. Uh, so we're, we're organized to manage it. Um, but yes, it's, but it took a, a, a you know, it was a, it was a fair amount of work. And of course, you, on top of that, you've, you've got your, your clients and, and, and yeah. uh, you've got the analysts and uh, that uh, community that you, uh, that you need to um, keep in touch with. Um, so how would you say hiring uh, at your shop has been affected by this pandemic? Um, well, hiring, I think for everyone's probably been difficult at this time, you know, difficulty to have in-person interviews. Um, you know, as a bank, we were already moving, we were trying to increase the level of internal mobility. So basically, you know, trying to fill as many places uh, through internal staff moves as opposed to external hiring. I mean, clearly we, we externally hire if we don't have appropriate internal candidates, um, but we certainly do try to make sure that people can get you know, a diverse experience through being able to move into different teams. So we try to prioritize that. As long as the people have the right skill sets or are trainable in a relatively short period of time to get you where you need to be in terms of that position. And um, so I said it's been more difficult. Um, you know, we've also had a shift in terms, you know, what you'll see is some number of banks and where one of them have been doing more nearshoring. So we've been building up teams in Montreal and other places. Um, which became a little bit more difficult. So I'd say hiring has definitely been more challenged, um, but we have stayed true certainly on our, our graduate recruitment. So our graduate rec recruitment program actually increased. Um, this year, 2020 was up by probably 15, 20% in terms of the number of people that we took in. And uh, 
onto the um, internship program. And, um, you know, normally, you know, 80, 85% of people actually then get hired into the bank um, for the next year. And um, so I said, that's that we kept going. We, we still did our sum, summer internship program remotely uh, for the uh, for the students. Um, so yeah, so I think our shift really is more towards internal hiring. Um, but it's tough, I mean, and also it's tough to get people externally to move. People in the middle of a pandemic are probably not that, that keen to be moving to a new organization where they may not see their teammates for six months. I mean, let's be clear, but I've, I've not been back to the office since March 23rd. Yes, I, uh, we can relate to that. Um, so then, uh, uh, you know, a lot of companies have uh, this policy of hiring internally. Uh, so uh, advice to students might be that if you like working for a company XYZ, uh, the stra a good strategy is to try to get a job, even though it may not be the ideal job, uh, just get into the company that you like to work for and then take advantage of the opportunities internally for uh, uh, growth and development. Um, so now, uh, talking about, um, uh, uh, you know, advice to students, uh, what sort of advice uh, might you give to students aspiring to uh, a successful career in ERM? You know, I, you know, I, I don't think there's a, a one size fits all. I mean, I do a, you know, a fair amount of mentoring of um, students. In fact, I've been doing a little bit of mentoring for some of my, uh, my daughter's Columbia fencing. <laughs> team in terms of, you know, who, who want to get into finance and, you know, I'll sit down and have, well, we have, but we would have, you know, sometimes they talk about, okay, if you want to get into the bank, you know, these are things that you should do or not do them and give them an idea about the business. I mean, for people coming into risk, I'd say it's, it's similar. It's, it's, there's not a one size fits all. So I think it's important for the person to really understand, you know, what aspect of risk management are they really keen in? And I think it's important to have a foundation in one of the key disciplines. I mean, I think you build, and then you develop maybe transversely from there, but, but get your building blocks in place first. Really have one area that you feel very comfortable in. It could be market risk. It could be credit. It could be operational risk. It could be, I'm interested in liquidity, or it could be cyber. And um, it could be a number of the different disciplines, but it's important to identify the area that you're really interested in. And then identify what are the skills needed and the qualifications needed to get a role in that area. After that, you know, it's, um, you know, you, we're talking here about, you know, young people. So the ability to adapt there and they'll sort of discover as they go along what they want to do. I mean, I've not been in risk all my life. You know, I started off as a, as an accountant, not that I ever wanted to be a chartered accountant in the UK. It was, it was, it was kind of driven, driven by, uh, at the time I was graduating, um, the UK was in a recession and the only people that were hiring were accountants. <laughs> accounting firm so I ended up being an accountant for a few years before going into banking um, but I think people have to decide what is they really interested in build the foundational knowledge there get into that discipline and they'll see over time there may be other things they decide that they'd like to try and if you're in the right type of organization then um, you'll get those moves or if you go to a smaller organization you may find that you're doing multiple of these disciplines at the same time it really depends on their profile and their ambition. Lloyd, thank you so much for sharing uh, your wonderful insights, experience, uh, ideas. Uh, 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 I know uh, I, for one, uh, have learned a great deal just by listening to you and seeing how you think and what you see uh, coming down the pike. So thank you so much on behalf of the program and on behalf of our students and our audience. Yeah, thanks, Bob. It's been a pleasure working with you and um, speak, getting to know the team a bit. So, no, I, and you know, I'm a Columbia Lion parent, so. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Couldn't do anything else. Couldn't do anything else. Great. Thank you so much.